iPhone 13 on us for every customer. Current, new, everyone to show the love. Blackstar Network is here. Hold no punches. I'm real uh, revolutionary right now. <laughs> Support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America, Roland. I love y'all. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black Owned Media and something like CNN. You can't be Black Owned Media and be skate. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Hey, folks, today is Thursday, uh, June 23rd, 2022. Uh, Roland Mark Unfiltered. I am broadcasting from Treehouse Studios here in Atlanta. Uh, we have a here with the uh, Acura team uh, for their uh, media drive. Coming up on today's show on Black Star Network, Supreme Court hands down some major decisions uh, rewarding conservatives on the issue of guns and also a shocking decision on Miranda rights. We'll break it down with our legal scholars. Also, the January 6th committee details specifically names the Republicans who sought a pardon from Donald Trump. We'll talk about that. We'll also have our HBCU Connect series continuing with talking to the president of Stillman College, one of our HBCUs. That and lots more. It's time to bring the funk on Roland Martin Unfiltered on the Black Star Network. Let's go. He's got it. Whatever the miss, he's on it. Whatever it is, he's got the scoop, the fact, the fine. And when it breaks, he's right on time. And it's rolling. Best believe he's knowing. Putting it down from sports to news to politics. With entertainment just for kicks, he's rolling. It's on go, 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 y'all. It's rolling, Martin. Yeah. Folks, it was it has been an unbelievable day uh, in news. Uh, first and foremost, the Supreme Court uh, came down with several decisions that have a dramatic impact on the issue of gun laws as well as Miranda rights. Uh, these are shocking decisions. I want to get right into it, first of all, uh, with our uh, panel. Joining me right now uh, is Ellie Mistel. He's an author. He's also a justice correspondent with The Nation, uh, author uh, 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 Ego, the Criminal Justice Project Director uh, for the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law. He joins us as well as uh, uh, attorney Terrain Bailey in Los Angeles. First and foremost, uh, let's deal with the Miranda decision that came down. Ellie, for our audience, explain what the hell the Supreme Court essentially did today by gutting Miranda rights. Okay, so anybody who's watched a legal show, right, has heard the Miranda warnings. You have the right to remain silent, you have the right to an attorney, um, and so on and so forth. So we all know what those warnings are, but those warnings aren't in the Constitution. They were created by a constitutional case called the v. Arizona, where Earl Warren and a 5-4 liberal majority ruled that in order to protect your Fifth Amendment rights against self-incrimination and your Sixth Amendment rights to an attorney, the cops had to give you this warning so that you would know the rights that you had coming to you. 
Today, in a case called uh, Vega v. Teco, the Supreme Court, uh, six to three, with Samuel Alito writing for the conservative majority, said basically that those warnings are no longer applicable, that the cops don't have to give you those warnings, because if they don't give you those warnings, you cannot sue them for a violation of your constitutional rights. Now, that doesn't mean that every kind of coerced um, confession or incriminating evidence can be admitted in court. If a cop beats you up and forces you to sign a, a document about something that you didn't do, um, that can still get suppressed at trial. The issue is that proving that the cop beat you up, proving that your confession or incriminating evidence was coerced is going to be a lot harder because that initial warning, that initial thing that the cop has to tell you to inform you of your rights, poof, no longer really exists. Uh, Terrain, um, how significant is this decision? So I, I, I really just want to clarify it, okay? In the criminal courts, OK, this decision does not impact the admissibility of um, core statements. You still have the option to pursue to have those statements that were coerced suppressed. This decision does not change that. What this decision does is it changes an, um, an access to some justice when your rights have been violated and your ability to sue under 1983 in the civil court. So there's two different spectrums here. Is what happens with Miranda in the criminal cases and what happens in, with Miranda in the civil case of whether or not Miranda gives the foundation to sue officers who violate the Miranda rights that are protected by the Constitution. Basically, what the majority said is that Miranda is not a constitutionally protected right, which triggers the ability for someone to sue under 1983, which is a civil action where you can sue a government entity for violating your rights and your privileges and your immunities. As far as the criminal cases are concerned, what the court said is you still have the right to have these coerced statements suppressed. So there's a big difference here between the criminal arena and the civil arena that this case impacts. But it no way says that the, the officers no longer have to give the Miranda warning. What it says is when they fail to give the Miranda warning, there's no recourse for defendants whose rights have been violated in the civil courts under 1983. Uh, but the author, what's... Let's look at the suppression. I just want to re re return the, the argument to Elena Kagan's dissent, where she says in her dissent that with this case, now some statements that would have clearly been illegal and suppressed before this ruling will be allowed into court. Now, you can now go later after you've had a tried and potentially after you've been convicted and say that those statements should have been excluded. You still always have that right. But even Elena Kagan in dissent says that there are now certain statements that would have been excluded before that now may not be. And that key difference is that before, you know, yesterday, if the cop doesn't Mirandize me and I say something I shouldn't have said, then that is a presumptive exclusionary statement, right? But now, if the cop doesn't Mirandize me and I say something I shouldn't have said, the cop can argue that I still somehow knew my rights and that that statement should be allowed and they can let the appeals court sorted out. So even Elena Kagan is like, this is this is a much bigger deal than Alito and the conservatives are trying to say that it is. Arthur. Thanks, Roland. Uh, and thanks for having me on. I agree that this case does not undermine Miranda in the criminal context, except for the fact that Alito bends over backwards to say, and, and Alito bends over backwards to say all of that. We're not touching Miranda in the criminal context. It, it survives this case in the criminal context. But if you read the case carefully, it really is, like Ellie said, an invitation by the court, by Alito, to, in a later case, undermine Miranda, get Miranda overruled in, uh, in the criminal context. If you look at the case, they really said, oh, look at the history of all of the cases that we have under Miranda. Look at everything that we've done. We're not touching it. If, I, if, if that's not an invitation for a prosecutor later on to challenge a Miranda ruling that goes against him or her, and then eventually take that up to the Supreme Court and have the Supreme Court rule specifically about Miranda in the criminal case. I don't know what it is. Um, and, and then as far as what Terrain said, I absolutely agree. This case, uh, in terms of, it, 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 so, so on the one hand, it cracks open the door the way that, uh, the way that um, um, both uh, Kagan and Ellie have described uh, in, uh, to reverse Miranda in, in future cases. 
And then I agree with what Terrain said, that this case is fundamentally, though, about police accountability. It's fundamentally about when the police purposefully, knowingly violate your rights. Let's say that you don't end up in a criminal proceeding and you say, you know what, I'm going to right. sue them. Right. And 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 what the Supreme Court through Alito has said is, nope, you can't do it when they violate your Miranda rights. I don't know what we I don't know what the court has been watching the last two years, frankly, since uh, since George Floyd was murdered. And, and the and the real the real aim of this country to try to, to, to reform policing, or at least certain voices in this country, but they certainly haven't wa been watching TV, and they certainly haven't been pursuing or considering police reform. And this case uh, is a step backwards. Uh, speaking of uh, what they had not been paying attention, uh, Ellie, this eight to one gun decision, I'm sorry, sorry, the six to three gun decision that basically throws out uh, the New York law uh, dealing with concealed guns. I mean, uh, and then, of course, then you read the, this, this opinion by Clarence Thomas where he wants to invoke the Dred Scott decision. My goodness. Yep, every case, every state is Texas now. What the court has done in uh, the Bruin decision, the guns case, is basically say that the states themselves do not have the right to regulate open carry of firearms, right? So in 2008, the Supreme Court created for the first time in American history uh, a right to bear arms for personal self-defense. That never been said before. Supreme Court made that so in 2008. Now, 2022, we have the Supreme Court inventing yet another new gun right, this time the right right to open carry that can't be abridged by states. Remember how I just put that. The Supreme Court is saying that the states do not have the right to regulate open carry um, in their polities. What's going to happen either tomorrow or Monday or next Thursday is that they're going to say that the states do have the right to regulate women's bodies and force them um, to carry pregnancies to term against their will. So you have the, the fundamental hypocrisy on display for all to see, for all to see, right? No states' rights to protect us from violence. Yes, states' rights to prevent women and pregnant people from having control over their bodies. That's just how the Supreme Court rolls now. They don't care about the logic or the hypocrisy of their arguments. They have six votes to do whatever they want, and they're doing it. Author? The biggest concern for me about the New York Rifle Association case is the intersection between guns and white supremacy, the intersection between guns and hate in this country. And it's not something that the Supreme Court considered in this case. It's not, it, it's not something that the Supreme Court uh, discussed. And in fact, uh, um, Justice Alito's um, comment in his concurrence in the case uh, really is a gut punch. He invokes Buffalo. He invokes the slaughter of uh, uh, 10 people who are going about their business um, in, in, at the top supermarket at, uh, being killed just because they were black. And, and, and a lot of the seniors uh, in that community um, um, were, were among the people that were being killed. And, and Alito invokes that and, and says the, the statute at issue in the New York Rifle Association case would not have prevented uh, that slaughter. He, he's entirely misreading the, the, the um, number one, um, the, the mood of the nation, and then number two, what the impact of this case will, will ultimately be. And and um, and this is this is about community safety. This is about the safety for Black and Brown people in this country. And and the problem with this case is it opens the door once again to the evisceration of reasonable gun safety laws around the nation. Must say, Terrain, uh, look, this this is a court that's pretty much saying, hey, states, y'all can roll, do what you want to do. This decision in the New York gun case is astounding, considering that we have a defendant today, this week, who is pleading not guilty to attempting to harm Justice Kavanaugh. What the Supreme Court is basically saying is, it's okay. And, and I don't think that they recognize that they're doing that. I mean, one of their own is at risk under this very broad interpretation of gun rights. Where does it end? And you look at Uvalde, you're saying basically that school systems, that states do not have the right to to uh, disallow people to walk into schools with guns. I mean, where does it uh, end? What are they, what are right. they trying to advance here? Uh, Ellie, I know you have to go. Rowan, I, I, 
Yes, I'll have to go ahead real quick. Go ahead. Ro Roland, can I can I add, can I add to that? In, in here in uh, in the in the uh, district and uh, in the area of the district, Maryland, <clears throat> excuse me, Maryland and Virginia, recently there was a situation where a, a school was locked down and a a parent rushed to the school with a gun, believing that this was a Uvalde type situation, um, when in reality it was nothing like that. And um, and and that's the danger of of what the, the step that this case takes. The, the second aspect of this case, too, and, and I don't want to overlook this today, Roland, is that in the case there were a group of a hundred uh, public defenders in New York City, um, black public defenders in New York City, that wrote an amicus brief actually supporting the New York Rifle Association in this case and brought up a really good point, which is when there are gun laws they are disproportionately enforced against black people. In other words, that, um, that what we have now is a situation where black and brown communities are forced to choose between reasonable gun safety laws and um, the ability to defend themselves. This is an unfair choice. Uh, black and brown communities should not be forced to choose between safety and justice. Um, L.A., the, the Supreme Court's decision regarding in North Carolina, uh, with now normally the Supreme Court said, oh, we stay out of political gerrymandering. But here you have a democratically elected attorney general, a Democrat. Republicans say, oh, he's not fiercely defending the voter suppression uh, ID law enough, so we should be able to do so. And the court goes, OK, you're right. Y'all go right ahead. I'm confused. Eight to one, like, it's not the most important case that was decided today, but it's easily the dumbest, okay? The, what happened is that the NAACP of North Carolina sued the state of North Carolina over its racistly gerrymandered maps. All right, so then uh, NAA, that lawsuit is ongoing. There's a Democratic governor in North Carolina. There's a Democratic attorney general in, in North Carolina. As they are required to do, they defend the state's maps. That's their job. But Republicans in the House uh, House of Representatives of North Carolina weren't happy with how vociferously the Democratic Attorney General was defending those racist maps. So for no other reason that they didn't like the Democratic Attorney General, they asked to intervene, and they wanted to be the ones to defend the—actually, the, the, it's, not a, it's not a gerrymander map, it's a voter ID law— um, they want to be the ones to defend the voter ID law from the NAACP. There's no precedent for allowing them to do that, but the Supreme Court, eight to one, with only Sonia Sotomayor dissenting brilliantly, eight to one says, yeah, sure, fine, whatever. Let the Republicans defend this law and replace a Democratic attorney general who was doing his job, doing a job that I wouldn't want to do, making an argument that I wouldn't want to make, but it's his job. He ran for office. He was elected. He was doing the job. Republicans didn't like it, and so they just basically removed him, and the Supreme Court, eight to one, said, okay, it's dumb. I don't know how else to explain it. Uh, Ellie, I know you have to go. I certainly appreciate you joining us on the show. I want to take that question to Arthur as well as Terrain. I mean, again, uh, when, when you think about this here, the Attorney General of the uh, of North Carolina made his decision. He's leading, and they're saying, no, 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 no. We're not going to sit here and have standing. What does this now open us up to, Arthur? The Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights and the Law has been fighting a lot of these voter ID laws, and these re these Republicans, it's rare you have, a, frankly, a Democratic attorney general, but they're basically now saying, oh, we're now going to uh, take over the defense. Uh, you know, uh, when Chief Justice Roberts ascended to the court and he described the court's role, the justice's role as calling balls and strikes, uh, it's clearly that's not what they're doing here. And and more more importantly, I think what we're seeing in the North Carolina case is the 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 fundamental distrust um, from uh, from um, one party uh, attacking another party in a situation where there's no real conflict, right? Both parties, both the Republicans and the um, and the Democrats who hold office and whose job it is to defend the case, um, had the same goal. But this distrust that we are seeing by the uh, the people who have intervened, the party that has intervened in this case, just reflects the distrust in this country. I mean, it's it's just so appropriate that this case was decided uh, during the January 6th hearings on the Hill. Uh, Terrain, your thoughts on this uh, decision? It's astounding that we have clear separation of powers outlined in our Constitution. 
on our state and our federal level. It is the role of the attorney general to look into these issues and, 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 and defend these cases. And for the Supreme Court to say, no, we're going to give that to the legislative branch, shows that they clearly are trying to undermine how our judicial process is set up and, and, and skew it in a way that supports the Republican agenda. I'm, I'm really surprised that um, by Kagan and Breyer, I, I'm, Breyer I'm, I'm really surprised by them, but it just, it, it's a silly decision. And I, 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 have, I did not see that coming anywhere. All right. I want to thank you, Terrain. I want to thank you, Arthur, uh, for your contribution on today's show. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Roman. Thank you. Got to go to break. We come back. I'll have my uh, normal Thursday panel, uh, including we welcome back uh, someone who's been gone for quite some time. We're certainly glad to see her. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network. Horizon just gave us all a brand new iPhone 13. We've been customers for years. I thought new phones were for new customers. We got iPhone 13s too, switched to Verizon two minutes ago. Ours were busted and we still got a shiny new one. Check it out. So wait, everybody gets the same great deal. I think that's the point. iPhone 13 on us for every customer, current, new, everyone on any unlimited plan, starting at just $35. All on the network more people rely on. On the next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie, we're talking all things mental health and how helping others can help you. We all have moments where we have struggles and on this week's show, our guests demonstrate how helping others can also help you. Why you should never stop giving and serving others on the next A Balanced Life here on Black Star Network. Love our new Alexa. It's a Buick. Yeah, Alexa. Buick. Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. Coach, that's a Buick. That's an Alexa. The Buick Enclave with available Alexa built in. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. How about sushi? I just had sushi for lunch yesterday. Yeah. How about tacos? Automatic emergency braking. One of six advanced safety features standard on every 2022 Chevy Equinox. Find new technology. Find new roads. Chevrolet. Patrol Grooming is a black-owned men's grooming company that delivers on this promise every day to men everywhere. Everything we do, every product we make, is designed to help you to present your best self. It's a promise they've kept since 1991 when they first introduced the Bump Patrol brand, the number one men's product for a smooth, bump-free shave and silky skin. Millions of cu uh, customers count on their exceptional skincare products which can be found at more than 30,000 retail stores in more than 50 countries around the world. Now you can have exceptional beard and skin care products that are as unique as you. Fellas, as we prepare to head back out into the world as COVID restrictions are being lifted, it's time to get our groove back. You can visit patrolgrooming.com to order a patrol grooming box and do this. Use the discount code. Hashtag Roland30. That's hashtag R-O-L-A-N-D-3-0 for a 30% discount at the checkout. We appreciate Patrol Grooming being a partner with us here at Roland Martin Unfiltered and the Black Star Network. Time to be smart. 
Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. I support this man, Black Media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, there's a difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. I got to defer to the brilliance of Dr. Carr and to the brilliance of the Black Star Network. I am rolling with rolling all the way. Honored to be on a show that you own, a Black man. <laughs> owns the show. Folks, Black Star Network is here. I'm real um, revolutionary right now. Wow. Roland was amazing on that. Stay hey, black. I love y'all. I can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Time to be smart. When we control our institutions, we win. We win. This is the most important news show on television of any racial background. Y'all put two, three, four, five, ten, fifteen, twenty, thirty dollars on this and keep this going. What you've done, Roland, since this crisis came out in full bloom. Anybody watching this, tell your friends. Go back and look at the last two weeks, especially of Roland Martin Unfiltered. I mean, hell, go back and look at the last two days. You've had sitting United States senators today, Klobuchar and Harris. Whatever you have that you have, you can bring to Roland Martin Unfiltered to support it. Please do, because this information may literally save your life. Watch Roland Martin Unfiltered daily at 6 p.m. Eastern on YouTube, Facebook, or Periscope, or go to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Support the Roland Martin Unfiltered Daily Digital Show by going to RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Our goal is to get 20,000 of our fans contributing 50 bucks each for the whole year. You can make this possible. RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. Hey, I'm Donnie Simpson. Hi, I'm Eric Nolan. I'm Shantae Moore. Hi, my name is Latoya Luckett, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. All right, folks, we're back at Roland Martin Unfiltered. Let's bring in uh, Dr. Greg Carr, Department of Afro-American Studies at Howard University, recent Cobra, Black Women Views, and for the first time back on our Thursday panel, Erica Savage Wilson. She has been uh, gone for quite some time. She had a serious, serious accident and head injury. She's been fighting back, and we are certainly glad to have her back uh, on our regular Thursday panel with Reese and Greg. She's been uh, sorely missed. We appreciate all the people who have been filling in uh, 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 filling in on Thursdays, uh, but I made it clear they've been filling in on Thursdays. Uh, Erica sent me an email. She said, hey, can I come back? I'll do a couple of days, a couple of times a month. You get the other panelists. I said, no, no, no. I said, we'll move. I said, we well, appreciate my, my friend Larry Walker, but we'll move Larry to another day. Erica, you get to slide back in your Thursday slot. And so we're certainly glad to have you back. Thank you so much, Roland. It's so good to be home. And I really appreciate you being my big brother throughout this whole time. Just want to give a quick shout out to the RMU fam that definitely hold, uh, held me down during this time. My big brother, Roland, Dr. Greg Carr, Dr. Avis Jones, the Weaver, and my good sis, my girl, Reese Colbert. Thank you all so much for holding me down during these past 15 months. 
Absolutely. So glad to have you back. Uh, so let's get right into it. There were a lot of people uh, who were bitching and moaning in 2016, saying that Hillary Clinton was the same as Donald Trump. We kept trying to tell these fools, don't play that game. Now, guess what? Here you have three conservative Supreme Court justices. Uh, as a result, conservatives now hold a 6-2-3 six, six uh, majority. And we are seeing what happens when they are in control with these three rulings today, dealing with guns, dealing with Miranda, and dealing with the issue of North Carolina, Greg. Yeah, absolutely. I think that probably for me, the most disappointing of the three uh, was Kagan and Breyer caving on the North Carolina case. They seem to still believe that there's something called a constitution and a democracy in this country. Sotomayor stood alone. And she stood alone on principle when, when you read the case. But I want to go back to, I think that was interesting. Ely took it all the way out. And Terrain ran it back in, then Arthur really put the case to the case. When you read that uh, Miranda case, the Vega versus Tika case, what you see them doing is chipping away at stare decisis and chipping away at federalism. And, uh, you know, Ellie is right. That's where they're going. But when you read the case, what you see is, as, uh, as Terrain said, they attack the civil side of Miranda, but they are setting it up to come for Miranda. Be very clear about that. And so they know they couldn't overturn so many precedents in one term, but they are setting it up. Now, when it comes to the New York State Rifle and Pistol Association versus uh, uh, Bruin case, the, the, the gun law case in New York, I think the most chilling thing for me was not Clarence Thomas's decision. I mean, he, he's fairly he's, he's a fairly, fairly silly minded individual or here is his 74th birthday, by the way. But he's been very consistent. When you read, however, the handmaid's. Uh, uh, concurrence. Uh, when you read Amy Comey Barrett, she asked the question, how long after, um, how long after a historical precedent has been set, can you go back into history and try to illuminate what was meant originally? Now, see, that should scare the hell out of everybody. And Breyer uh, picked it up in his dissent. Breyer says the court ignored all the historical evidence that flies in the face of what gun control should mean and what the Second Amendment should mean. That's why he starts his dissent with having people been killed in the last couple of years. But what Comey Barrett is setting up is the idea that we can go back into history and reinterpret meaning for anything. What they really are setting up for Barrett, it's going to be the white Christian nationalism and the theocracy. That's where you get that Carson versus Macon case where they're going to take state money and let you pay for religious education. That's a theocracy. And as Ely said, finally, what they're setting up is we will control what we want to control, namely uh, we'll shrink the First Amendment and say that uh, you can't control your bodies, women. But when we decide we want to intervene on the other side, we'll just do it. Read Comey Barrett's uh, concurrence. Comey Barrett is saying you know, we can go back into history and do whatever the hell we want. We'll put our words in the in the mouths of the founders if we decide. It's just scared the hell out of everybody. Racy, uh, and look, of course, we, we expect their decision to come down next week with regards to Roe v. Wade, the case out of Mississippi. But they're more than likely going to allow these states to impose the level of restrictions and whatever they want, which pretty much uh, will invalidate Roe v. Wade. And so that's what, this, that's what this conservative Supreme Court is doing. This is not about the law. This is about conservative ideology. Absolutely. And there's something particularly gross about them invoking the 14th Amendment for this ridiculous gun law decision when they are getting ready to turn the 14th Amendment up on its head to get rid of Roe v. Wade. But I would challenge um, respectfully Terrain's assertion that maybe the court doesn't know what they're doing. The court is being very deliberate right now. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Carr just touched on that. What they're doing is they are deconstructing society as we know it because they're going to have to play dirty. They're going to have to fight dirty in order to maintain white minority rule. And it's just around the corner. See, we go election by election and what have you done for me lately, but the Republicans and the right-wingers play the long game. And so when you deconstruct the ability for states to regulate gun control, whites already have a higher incidence of gun control. You make it even easier for them. What does that mean? Then you turn around and you create the, per the, the perception that anybody can have a gun at any time. What does that mean for black folks? Driving while black, playing video games while black, sleeping while black, running while black. What does it mean for us? 
it creates a pretext for even more state-sanctioned violence. And then you throw Miranda on top of that and say, well, maybe you're not going to get the stuff thrown out in court. We're not, we're not challenging that. But we're damn sure removing any incentive, any personal incentive, the same way qualified immunity removes incentive from cops to actually read your rights. So good luck, dummies. Hopefully, when you get pulled over by the cops, you just shut your motherfucking mouth. So there is so much that's happening right now. It all plays together. It all plays together, and it's very deliberate because they're preparing for the next salvo. It's part of it is happening right now. And what they're saying is we don't give a damn about Buffalo. We don't give a damn about Uvalde. Now, granted, these cases would have been decided beforehand, but obviously they they waited till some of the dust settled. And it's funny how quick the dust settled on 19 children being killed, on 10 people getting slaughtered in a grocery store. The dust sure did settle quickly, and they understand that. But they waited on that. But before that, there had been tons of massacres that have happened, tons of gun, gun violence. And they're saying, good luck, bitches, because they sure made sure they had their security from the Senate and the House passed before these rulings came out. We're on our own. And that's what they're banking on, a better armed white nationalist militia, uh, a, a, a more emboldened police state that already terrorizes Black communities, and let the chips fall where they may. That's right. The thing here, um, um, uh, Erica, is that, uh, as Greg pointed out from Amy Coney Barrett, the bottom line of this year, they have been angry by so-called liberal decisions. Uh, they've been pissed off since Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, and again, not Democrats, conservatives. And the reality is those conservatives are now in the Republican Party. And so, yeah, they want to absolutely roll back decisions made over the last 50 plus years. And so, and this is what they have been planning for. This is what the Heritage Society, uh, the, the Heritage Foundation is all about. This is what uh, the Scaves and the Melons have been funding for 50 plus years. This is exactly what the Fairless Society has been all about. They have been plotting this, and not just on the Supreme Court, but they have been infiltrating the entire federal judiciary with these type of judges, and they are growing. They literally are right now raising up folks who are 13, 14, 15, who will then go to college, who will then come out and clerk for Supreme Court justices. And so that's playing the long game. You're absolutely right. And so these Democrats who are sitting on their asses by acting as if, oh, the courts will always protect us. Hello. Absolutely. I agree with everything that Greg and Reese said. And I just want to touch on something that Reese said a moment ago when she used the word deconstruction. I want us to all go back, particularly those that um, are watching us, Black Star Network, um, Facebook, YouTube, to what Steve Bannon said. We all live in the DMV. He said this um, over in Maryland, February of 2017. He sat on stage in front of conservatives. It was published in every publication and said that the aim, the goal of that uh, massive criminal um, organization uh, known as the Son of a Klansman's um, administration, what their regime's goal was to deconstruct the administrative state, period. And they have gone about the business of doing that since 2017. Here we are in 2022, uh, subjected to footage of um, folks who have been emboldened by law enforcement, uh, by folks who are being paid upwards of $174,000 a year, um, plus free medical benefits, all at your expense, taxpayers. Um, and what they are doing is showing footage of people who were in locksteps with this hostile group, no longer known as the Republican Party, but a complete hostile group, uh, that this group emboldened millions of people over a period of time through the now dead and gone voice of Rush Limbaugh and others to ensure that their followers knew that no matter if, even if they weren't successful in overturning this election, that power would be theirs by any means necessary. So for folks that like to have hot takes on social media that think that um, they are going to withhold their votes and that they're proving a point, what in the hell are you going to do when Shea Moss talked about white people coming to her grandmother's house, knocking on her door, her grandmother opens up the door and demands to do a citizen's arrest. What are you going to do then? Are you going to tweet about that? Will you have access to Twitter and any other social media account? This is what Reese and Greg and everybody that has been um, echoing for many, many years. 
they are playing the long game. This short bullshit saying that you're going to sit out for midterm, saying you're going to sit out for presidential, saying really silly things that really amount to, okay, well, maybe you did get a whole lot of attention. But, sweetie, while you're getting attention, they're making sure that those three big pieces of federal legislation that ensure your freedom, your ability to be able to do the things that you and your children are doing now, they're ensuring that that is going to be all but going away in a matter of time. So it really is time for people to stop sleepwalking and to understand that the war is here. How are you going to participate? Mm. Come on, come on, Erica. It's good to see you, sis. That's what yes. we was missing. That's what we was missing right there, brother. <laughs> Listen, it's a three-part course. You know what I mean? So, no, um, it, it's good to be back with you all. I've been watching you all um, faithfully um, on Thursdays, and it infuriates me for all of this good knowledge, a luminary, a, a woman who has been very much so unabashed about not only... Uh, elections as it relates to the White House, but we're talking about local, we're talking about state elections, all of this free knowledge that people get every week and the audacity of people to still go about the business of hot takes on social media like, that shit is over. They're mm -hmm. not coming for our neck. They're at your neck. And all I'm they're already. doing is waiting for, they're already at your neck. All they're doing is just waiting for the next installment of this long-term deconstruction of administrative state that has not just been happening since 2017. It was announced in plain language in 2017. But we look over at France, and I know that Dr. Carr watches international news, and so does Reese. Um, but we just saw that um, Le Pen, Marine Le Pen, just won. Now, you have... Uh, um, your guy who would be considered for all intents and purposes over in France, um, I'm not recalling his name at the moment, to be somewhat of a um, democratic leader, but he's lost his legislative house to who? The right wing. That just mm -hmm. happened in France not more than, what, 24, 36 hours ago. And who was mm -hmm. heavily involved in that campaign? Dr. Carr told y'all this years ago. Steve Bannon, this mm -hmm. is a global attack. And the silly things that people are doing on social media is serving just for a blip. When you look at, as you all continue to say, the long term, when you look at what's going to be happening this year, what's going to be happening two and three years from now, it is not, hyper it is not hyperbolic to say that democracy is at stake. Mm -hmm. um, at stake. It is what remnants of democracy are we going to maintain? Yep. Mm. Absolutely. Here. Absolutely. Uh, and again, for, for all the people who sit here and say voting doesn't matter, trust me, sure. who you vote in the Senate determines who confirms uh, federal judges, Supreme Court justices, who you vote for president and elect. That's who picks those uh, nominees. Uh, folks, hold tight. Got to go to break. We come back. We're going to talk about the January 6th committee. Oh, they named names today and further exposed how Donald Trump and the Republican Party was doing everything they can to use the Department of Justice as a weapon against their critics. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network, live from us from Atlanta. Back in a moment. Love our new Alexa. It's a Buick. Yeah, Alexa. Buick. Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. Coach, that's a Buick. That's an Alexa. The Buick Enclave with available Alexa built in. On the next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie, we're talking all things mental health and how helping others can help you. We all have moments where we have struggles, and on this week's show, our guests demonstrate how helping others can also help you. Why you should never stop giving and serving others on the next A Balanced Life here on Black Star Network. How about sushi? I just had sushi for lunch yesterday. How about tacos? Automatic emergency braking, one of six advanced safety features standard on every 2022 Chevy Equinox. Find new technology, find new roads, Chevrolet. Patrol Grooming is a black-owned men's grooming company that delivers on this promise every day to men everywhere. 
Everything we do, every product we make, is designed to help you to present your best self. It's a promise they've kept since 1991 when they first introduced the Bump Patrol brand, the number one man's product for a smooth, bump-free shave and silky skin. Millions of cu uh, customers count on their exceptional skincare products, which can be found at more than 30,000 retail stores in more than 50 countries around the world. Now you can have exceptional beard and skincare products that are as unique as you. Fellas, as we prepare to head back out into the world as COVID restrictions are being lifted, it's time to get our groove back. You can visit patrolgrooming.com to order a patrol grooming box and do this. Use the discount code. Hashtag Roland30. That's hashtag R O L A N D 30 for a 30% discount at the checkout. We appreciate Patrol Grooming being a partner with us here at Roland Martin Unfiltered and the Black Star Network. All right, so a lot of y'all always asking me about terms some of the pocket squares that I wear. Now, I don't know, Robert don't have one on. Now, I don't particularly like the white pocket squares. I don't like even the silk ones. And so I was reading GQ magazine a number of years ago, and I saw uh, this guy who had this, this pocket square here, and it looks like a flower. Uh, this is called a shibori pocket square. This is how the Japanese manipulate the fabric to create this sort of flower effect. So I'm going to take it out and then place it in my hand so you see what it looks like. And I said, man, this is pretty cool. And so I tracked down, the. it took me a year to find a company that did it. Uh, and so uh, they make these about 47 different colors. And so I love them because, again, as men, we don't have many accessories to wear. So we don't have many options. Uh, and so this is really a pretty cool uh, pocket square. And what I love about this here is you saw uh, when it's uh, in, in the pocket, you know, it gives you that flower effect like that but if I wanted to also unlike other because if I flip it and turn it over it actually gives me a different type of texture and so therefore it gives me a different look so there you go so uh, if you actually want to uh, get one of these shibori pocket squares we have them in 47 different colors all you got to do is go to rollingthismartin.com forward slash pocket squares so it's rollingthismartin.com forward slash pocket squares. All you got to do is go to my website uh, and you can actually uh, get this. Now, for those of you who are members of our Bring the Funk fan club, there's a discount for you to get our pocket squares. That's why you also got to be a part of our Bring the Funk fan club. Uh, and so that's what we want you to do. And so it's pretty cool. So if you want to jazz your look up, you can do that. In addition, uh, Y'all see me with some of the feather pocket squares. My sister who's a designer. She actually makes these. They're all custom made. So when you also go to the website, you can also order one of the customized uh, feather pocket squares uh, right there at rollingsmartin.com forward slash pocket squares. So please do so. And of course, uh, it goes to support the show. And again, if you're a Brenda Funk fan club member, you get a discount. This is why you should join the fan club. Time to be smart. Roland Martin's doing this every day. Oh, no punches! Thank you, Roland Martin, for always giving voice to the issues. Look for Roland Martin in the whirlwind, to quote Marcus Garvey again. The video looks phenomenal, so I'm really excited to see it on my big screen. Support this man, black media. He makes sure that our stories are told. See, this difference between black star network and black owned media and something like cnn i gotta defer to the brilliance of dr carr and to the brilliance of the black star network i am rolling with rolling all the way honored to be on a show that you own a black man <laughs> owns the show folks black star network is here i'm real uh, revolutionary right now the crowd rolling was amazing on that Stay black. i love y'all i can't commend you enough about this platform that you've created for us to be able to share who we are, what we're doing in the world, and the impact that we're having. Let's be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You can't be black on media and be scared. You dig? Hello everyone, it's Kiara Sheard. Hey, I'm Taj. I'm Coco. And I'm Lily. And we're at SWV. What's up, y'all? It's Ryan Destiny, and you're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered.
All right, folks, welcome back to Roller Martin on the Filter. So I'm actually here at Treehouse Studios, also ELS Studios. Uh, I'm actually in Atlanta with the folks from Acura. They uh, actually have their, uh, we've been test driving their cars, including their top of the line uh, sports car. I didn't push it to 150 miles, but I did get up to 105 on the highway. Uh, and so uh, we are, of course, ex- just experiencing uh, this whole thing here, me and a n- number of other people uh, with black-owned media and other uh, minority-owned media folks. And so uh, so we were fine. We finally got our connection straight in here. I had to do it from the car. Look, y'all know me. I'm going to improvise as best as we can. And so that's what we had to do. So everything worked out fine. Uh, let's get right back into our show. Today, the January 6th committee took place uh, where they held their hearing in uh, at Look, they laid it out showing you exactly what Republicans were doing uh, trying to help Donald Trump steal this election. Uh, Congressman Benny Thompson, the chair of the committee, he laid it all out in terms of exactly uh, what was at play. December 20th. In our previous hearings, the select committee showed that then-President Trump applied pressure at every level of government, from local election workers up to his own vice president hoping public servants would give in to that pressure and help him steal an election he actually lost. Today, we'll tell the story of how the pressure campaign also targeted the federal agency charged with enforcement of our laws, the Department of Justice. We already covered part of Mr. Trump's effort. We heard from Attorney General Bill Barr Tell the story and the the committee about the baseless claims Mr. Trump wanted the Justice Department to investigate, and that Mr. Barr viewed those claims as nonsense. Today, we'll hear from Jeffrey Rosen, the person Mr. Trump appointed to run the Justice Department after Attorney General Barr resigned. We'll hear from other senior Justice Department officials also. Together, these public servants resisted Mr. Trump's effort to misuse the Justice Department as part of his plan to hold on to power. And we will show that Trump's demands that the department investigate baseless claims of election fraud continued into January 2021. But Donald Trump didn't just want the Justice Department to investigate. He wanted the Justice Department to help legitimize his lies, to basically call the election corrupt, to appoint a special counsel to investigate alleged election fraud, to send a letter to six state legislatures urging them to consider altering the election results. Congressman Adam Kinzinger of Illinois, one of two Republicans who are on the committee, he also uh, spoke uh, today. Mr. Donahue, on December 27th, you had a 90-minute conversation with the president where he raised false claim after false claim with you and Mr. Rosen. How did you respond to what you called a, quote, stream of allegations? The December 27th conversation... um, was, uh, in my mind, an escalation of the earlier conversations. As the former acting AG indicated, there were a lot of communications that preceded that. As we got later in the month of December, the uh, president's entreaties became more urgent. He became more adamant that we weren't doing our job. We need to step up and do our job. Um, And he had this arsenal of allegations um, that he wanted to um, to rely on. And so I felt in that conversation that was incumbent on on me to make it very clear to the president what our investigations had revealed and that we had concluded based on actual investigations, actual witness interviews, actual reviews of documents, that these allegations simply had no merit. And I wanted to try to cut through the noise because it was clear to us that there were a lot of people whispering in his ear, feeding him these conspiracy theories and allegations. And I felt that being very blunt in that conversation might help make it clear to the president that these allegations were simply not true. And so as he went through them in what for me was a 90-minute conversation or so, and what for the former acting AG was a two-hour conversation, um, as the president went through them, I went piece by piece to say, no, that's false. That is not true.
All right, folks, uh, a former White House official also named, in her testimony, she named the five Republicans who sought a pardon for their, for their activities regarding January 6th. And was Representative Gates requesting a pardon? Believe so. The, the general tone was, we may get prosecuted because we were defensive of, you know, the president's positions on these things. The pardon that he was discussing, requesting, was as broad as you could describe from the beginning. Of, I remember he's from the beginning of time up until today for any and all things. I think he mentioned Nixon, and I said Nixon's pardon was never nearly that broad. And are you aware of any members of Congress seeking pardons? I guess Mr. Gates and Mr. Brooks, I know, have both advocated for there to be a blanket pardon for members involved in that meeting and a handful of other members that weren't at the December 21st meeting um, as the preemptive pardons. Uh, Mr. Gates was personally pushing for a pardon, and he was doing so since early December. I'm not sure why. Uh, Mr. Gates had reached out to me to ask if he could have a meeting with Mr. Meadows about receiving a presidential pardon. Did they all contact you? Not all of them, but several of them did. So you mentioned Mr. Gates, Mr. Brooks. Um, Mr. Biggs did. Mr. Jordan talks about congressional pardons, but he never asked me for one. It was more for an update on whether the White House is going to pardon members of Congress. Mr. Gomer asked for one as well. And he, Mr. Perry asked for a pardon too. I'm sorry, I need to cut Mr. Perry, did he talk to you directly? directly? Yes, he did. Did uh, Marjorie Taylor Reed contact you? No, she didn't contact me about it. I heard that she had asked White House Counsel's Office for a pardon from Mr. Philbin, but I didn't frequently communicate with Ms. Green. Are you aware of any conversations or communications regarding the possibility of giving Congressman Matt Gates a pardon? Um, I know he had asked for it, but I don't know if he ever received one or what happened with it. How do you know that Congressman Gates asked for a pardon? He told me. Uh, tell us about that. He told me he'd ask Meadows for a pardon. Were you involved in or did you witness any conversations about the possibility of a blanket pardon for everyone involved in January 6th? Uh, I had heard that mentioned, yeah. Do you know whether the president had any conversations about potentially pardoning any uh, family members? Um, I know he had hinted at a blanket pardon for the January 6th thing for anybody, um, but I think he had for all the staff and everyone involved, not with January 6th, but just before he left office, I know he had talked about that. Well, right there, uh, we see exactly what they laid out. Reese, uh, it's abundantly clear where the Republicans stand uh, on this. You don't ask for a pardon unless you know you did something illegal. about because it wasn't nobody gonna do shit about it anyway so that's probably why donald trump didn't even bother to pardon them why bother pardon pardon people that are never going to really be held accountable i mean we have seen a, a mountain of evidence of wrongdoing trust me if we was talking about um black lives matter having these kind of meetings to overturn goddamn local council uh, uh race all of these people would be in jail by now but there's two separate different rules. But, I mean, what's clear is that the law and order party don't give a damn about the laws. They don't give a damn about the rules. And what's scary is how all of this was held together by people deciding to honor institutions, honor the, 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 the concept of fair and free elections. But we know that Trump and his minions are pursuing a more administrative route next time by going after the Secretary of State, by going after changing how um, electors are selected, whether it be the legislature or whatever else. So they have, this time, they got away with it. And obviously, 
with the 2024 election, there's going to be a Merrick Garland DOJ. But when we see Democrats um, tend to, you know, adhere to institutions, I fear that even when people, you know, you have secretaries of states or you have Republican legislators that try to overturn the results of the popular vote in their states, I fear that they might say, well, dims the rules in those states. The Supreme Court ain't going to do shit about it. So I think there's a lot to be very much concerned about here because this was an overwhelming decisive win by Biden-Harris in terms of the popular vote, in terms of the Electoral College. But when we look at the fact that in the past 28 years, Republicans have only won the popular vote one time. And yet we've had two illegitimately elected Republican presidents and one who we've been documenting is trying to steal a, a second term. I don't have as much faith in the institutions. But I, but I say that not to say I'm not trying to attack Democrats, because one thing I don't want today to be about when the Republicans are showing their whole ass from the legislature to the, to the Supreme Court is about what Democrats could do. Right now, we need to really focus on the true enemy of, I don't even want to say democracy, because we know we ain't got no damn democracy in this country, but the enemy of society. And as my girl L. Joy Williams earlier today said on a show that I was on her with, humanity. That's what's at stake here. Uh, Erica, uh, to that particular point, uh, again, when you begin to look at uh, how substantial this is, I keep saying this. If you don't hold folks accountable, trust me, they will go further. I mean, it's not like they're sitting there shaking their boots. Now, what's also happening, uh, we know today at the Department of Justice, as a result of these hearings, executed warrants uh, against a number of people based upon these January 6 hearings. What's amazing is as if they didn't know this stuff beforehand, it's as if the DOJ, so when Mayor Garland said his prosecutors were paying attention, that is the case. The FBI executed search warrants today on a former DOJ lawyer uh, who wrote one of the memos saying that he would take over as AG and do uh, what Donald Trump wanted. Yes, absolutely. And, and just to Reese's point, when you think about how they're really uh, two separate applications of the laws, just depending on uh, what color hue human that you are, it really should have people understanding the severity, the place that we are in. And there's very limited time. Um, you're thinking about um, even when Shea Moss talked about, uh, or it was talked about when Shea Moss testified, uh, the number of subpoenas that had been executed and the number of people who had just flagrantly uh, decided that they were not going to show up or uh, like you have some members of the former regime to say, well, we're going to shield ourselves under the former regime that uh, we were under the administration for. And, and we're going to say that we have some level of executive privilege and going to continue to wait it, wait it out. Well, though they've been indicted, these people have not been arrested. And you think about folks that have been not only arrested, but pulled out of their home or had their homes knocked in and knocked in, excuse me, um, by mistake. It really should have people very much so concerned. So some of the things that people really should take a breather and take a step back from um, having conversations. I just saw a piece that was published in The Economist today. Again, Reese was just on another show talking about the 2024 ticket and there's a need for um, other people to be on the ticket outside of the winning team. Leave that shit alone. Be very clear that who bodies make up the base of the Democratic Party look like me, they look like Reese, they look like Greg, and they look like Roland. We have to be sure that there are protections that are in place, not only for us, but for those that are coming up behind us to make sure that they're not as fragile or they're at least a bit stronger than they are now. So when we have all of these institutions that are very much saying we're siding with the apartheid um, place that the United States is headed to, we have to be um, even doubly sure, even in Atlanta, I know they had some elections that were happening and people were talking about how they were lining up to early vote to make sure that you are participating in your local elections. Because as Reese laid out, when we start looking at these people that are supposed to be certifying elections, if they don't have a measure um, of wherewithal to say that I am going to perform and execute my due diligence, if there has been an executive in, um, in, in power that says that, well, I'm able to nullify and, and write across that, and I will say the election is certified in favor of someone that looks like me or who has the same ideology as me, 
um, we're definitely heading um, down um, a, a really troublesome lane, particularly as those people who are elected into office that have that type of ideologue or subscribe to that ideologue continue to multiply. So it's really incumbent on all of us as we continue to see all of this evidence that's pouring out um, before us about people who did not give a damn, who are only interested in power, that we make sure that we're doing our part and we're showing up and not being a part of the chatter that's chipping away at the power that we have as people that are connected to the party. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, if people want to play games, go right ahead. But I can guarantee you, and we said, we hashtag, we tried to tell you, I can guarantee you what is being planned, what they want to do, will absolutely not achieve any of the policy goals uh, that a lot of these black people out here who are chirping. And guess what? Y'all can yell, holler, and scream, oh, you shilling for the Democrats all you want to, but go ahead and mess around and find out. Mess around and see what exactly happens. Because, Greg, what we're seeing right now is a preview. I said in 2009 that we were living, we were, we were, we were in the beginning of white minority resistance. And this mm -hmm. thing is going to intensify. And so if people want to sit here and play games on social media, if y'all want to follow some loud mouth individuals, okay, who you never see at any black events, who you never see them on the ground doing anything, y'all go right ahead. And trust me, many of you in a year or two years or five years are going to be saying, damn, we should have listened to the folks on Black Star Network. We should listen to Roland. We should listen to Greg. should listen to Erica. should listen, listen to Reese because what these people have in plan have in store pales in comparison to what they've already done absolutely Ro. absolutely and i think it, it, it's imperative for us to remember that what they have planned is what they've always had planned i'm talking mm -hmm. about from when the first mm -hmm. settlers came here from europe this structure was set up to do what it is doing the glitch in their system is us in other mm -hmm. words we were brought here to work you understand? Mm. Fighting our way out of that, and we freed ourselves. Let's be very clear about that. Fighting our way out of that upset the model. Understand, and you know, I'm so glad you back, uh, Erica, because again, you, you ex-military. When you give a general order, the way I understand it, sis, uh -huh. that applies to members in the military. When Granger gave general order number three on Juneteenth and said it applied to all the people, you already ripping up the floorboards of their rules. But that's because we wouldn't be denied. He had 70-some thousand black men around him with guns in their hands. In other words, this, we are the glitch in the system. The system works just fine. Now, and this is mm. why... I respect Benny Thompson today. See, Thompson, and he, again, man, you laid it out, Reese. Just the long game. Yeah. Thompson is making an improvisational move in the middle of this. Remember, they're supposed to wrap this thing up in July. He puts mm -hmm. King Ginger out there, and now they're going to pull it into July now, because they, well, I'm sorry, they're supposed to end it in June, maybe five or six pieces. Now they're going to bleed it into July. Why? Because, yes, I would prefer to have Merrick Garland on the Supreme Court other than uh, uh, Gorsuch, but I'm not sure that Merrick Garland wouldn't have voted along with G Magana Gorsuch in, in the NAACP case. But that's neither here nor there. One thing's for sure. Uh, the reason he was picked by Obama is because he ain't got no backbone. But look at Benny Thompson forcing him into a backbone by stretching this thing out, and it's adjusting in real time. Now you got to go and get Jeff Clark House. Why? Because that's the guy I'm putting this guy on trial. Now, this, then this dude, uh, the attorney general, can slap, slap braces on Andrew Gillum at the drop of a hat. Mm. And meanwhile, mm -hmm. these other cats are going to give me full blanket pardons. And the boy told you all, sitting in his house with a bat with justice on the wow. side of it, which cracks me up, saying that even Nixon didn't ask for a black a, 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 a pardon. But I'll end with this. Sean Penn went down there today. Why is Sean Penn there? Sean Penn says, I just want to see if justice is going to come. Watch what's happening. These white nationalists are trying to reimagine themselves and re-narrate themselves as heroes. Every last mm. one of these white boys and girls telling on Trump was with them. So now oh, they trying to ease back up out the gutter and say, well, I told him it was mm. bullshit. Or I told him. Why? Mm. Because the white nationalist party has recognized that the Democratic Party is weak enough 
to still think they can chase them two or three white toothless voters. I wish Stacey Abrams wasn't running ads in Georgia saying that the police are underpaid, but that's the strategy. If we can just talk to them. No, this is for all the marbles. Y'all better listen to Erica. This is for all the marbles. They cannot be persuaded. What Benny Thompson is doing is trying to take away all their hiding places and leverage mm -hmm. the Department of Justice to force them in real time to make it us versus them. And we'll see how well he, he succeeds in that. Come on. And we don't Folks want to see understand no low level been... people because no. Mueller, he had Come that on. long ass investigation that didn't lead to shit. He got one funky ass little conviction of Papadopoulos that they done played <laughs> down. Uh, Manafort got off, Scott Free got pardoned, uh, Roger Stone didn't have nothing, nobody got right. nothing, they had uh, a, a memo, that was it, oh, we can't right. do nothing to Trump. I personally don't think anything is gonna happen to Trump, but what I will say, like, like Dr. Carr just mentioned, if you can go and send FBI agents undercover to have a conversation with a Tallahassee mayor, then God damn it, go see somebody to have conversations in these damn bars on K Street with these white boys sitting up there bragging about being insurrectionists. It's, 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 it's getting sickening to have to constantly right. defend this so-called system when the system continues to work the way it does, fucking over black people and giving the free yes. pass to white folks. It's yes. not sustainable. Absolutely. It's not sustainable. And we're going to tell you to vote because we ain't got no other choice unless we all going to pick up guns and we ain't got the aim that we need. <laughs> so we ain't got the guns that we need to have. So that's our only option for now until it ain't an option no more. But I'm sick and tired of it just like everybody else is sick and tired of it. Mm -hmm. Right. And we need for people to all right, stop folks, hold, the day hold tight one sec. of those people that are doing those things that Reese just talked about. Stop singing that chorus. That's right. All right, folks, hold tight one second. I got to go to a break. Uh, we come back, our black and missing some other news. Plus, we'll hear from the president of Stillman College about what she has in store for that Alabama university. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered live in Atlanta on the Black Star Network. Don't forget to support us in what we do. Download the Black Star Network app on all available platforms, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire, Samsung TV, also Xbox. And, of course, support us in what we do with our Bring the Funk fan club. Your dolls make it possible for us to be able to travel this country, reporting the news that matters to you. Uh, and so please support us. Uh, you can send your checks and money orders to our P.O. Box. You see the address there. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Filtered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Rolling at rollingmartinunfiltered.com. We'll be right back iPhone 13 on us for every customer. Current, new, everyone to show the love. How about sushi? I just had sushi for lunch yesterday. How about tacos? Automatic emergency braking, one of six advanced safety features standard on every 2022 Chevy Equinox. Find new technology, find new roads, Chevrolet. Next on The Black Table with me, Greg Carr. A very different take on Juneteenth with the one and only Dr. Sunyata Ahmed. We'll explore the amazing foods, remedies, and rituals that are a part of our history and the Juneteenth holiday. So it's our responsibility to return the healthier version to our folks instead of just the red liqueurs marketed to us, the red sodas and the other things. I mean, why does the Kool-Aid man have to sound like Louis Armstrong? He's like, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Right. An enlightening and tasty hour of the Black Table only on the Black Star Network. Love our new Alexa. It's a Buick. Yeah, Alexa. Buick. Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. Coach, that's a Buick. That's an Alexa. The Buick Enclave with available Alexa built in. I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and it's time to get wealthy. This economy is going topsy-turvy. What does this mean for recent graduates from college? We're talking with Leilani Brown, author of, of From Campus to Career. One of the first things that a graduate can do that serves them well is learning how to tell their story. That's right here on Get Wealthy, only on Black Star Network. Get your freak on, get your freak on, get your freak on. 
On the next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie, we're talking all things mental health and how helping others can help you. We all have moments where we have struggles, and on this week's show, our guests demonstrate how helping others can also help you. Why you should never stop giving and serving others on a next A Balanced Life here on Black Star Network. June is Black Music Appreciation Month. Today we are highlighting rock and roll. Rock and roll incorporates elements from all African American music genres. It was born in the 1950s and heavily appealed to the rebellious American youth of the time. It has had a substantial crossover with white audiences that inspired the genre of rockabilly. This crossover led to covers or partial rewritten songs made to be more palatable for white audiences. For example, popular rock and roll song Hound Dog was originally recorded by Big Mama Thornton and later by Elvis Presley. Sly Stone, Tina Turner, Little Richard, Boa Ditley, Aretha Franklin, and Prince are among the many known and loved legends that commandeer the rock and roll music genre. Rock and roll birthed several subgenres of doo wop, pop, and British rock and roll, just to name a few. My name is Charlie Wilson. Hi, I'm Sally Richardson Whitfield. And I'm Dodger Whitfield. Hey everybody, this is your man Fred Hammond, and you're watching Roland Martin, my man, unfiltered. <laughs> All right, folks, Austin Whitlock Williams was last seen in Milwaukee, Wisconsin on June 12th. Of the 13-year-old is 5 feet tall, weighs 100 pounds, with black hair and brown eyes. Anyone with information about Austin Whitlock Williams should call, contact the Milwaukee, Wisconsin Police Department at 414-933-4444, 414-933-4444. A building named after a Minnesota sheriff with ties to the KKK will soon have a new name. Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Center City Council, uh, they passed a resolution uh, to change the name of the uh, Earl Brown Heritage Center to the Heritage Center of Brooklyn Center. Uh, Earl Brown was sheriff uh, of the of Hennepin County during uh, the 1920s. During his tenure, Brown was an active member of the KKK and did nothing to stop the Klan's terrorism. It will cost the city $165,000 uh, to change signs and logos for the new name. Brooklyn Center is also the city where police officer Kim Potter killed Dante Wright. The Wright family agreed this week to the city's $3.25 million wrongful death lawsuit. Uh, these type of things, of course, are happening uh, all across the country. When you look at the renaming uh, of various buildings, and of course, uh, when we talk about uh, the folks who are most defending that, uh, it is largely uh, Republicans who are doing so. And but uh, and and then what you see is you see them constantly uh, going, well, uh, you know, uh, this is all this is all woke. This is all woke. This is all woke. Uh, in fact, uh, I saw something the other day, uh, Greg, that I thought was very interesting. You Now you have uh, all of these uh, conservatives uh, who are upset because President Joe Biden uh, has endorsed the Federal Reserve's um, focus on racial equality in, in in wealth. There was a story that was in the Wall Street Journal. And so I, I saw these various commentators uh, like uh, Andrew Sullivan. We all remember him, of course, with his uh, ridiculous uh, uh, takes uh, on uh, the bell curve. Uh, and they call this Biden's extremism. And, and this is what I keep trying to explain to people again when we talk about this idea of white fear. Here they are upset because uh, we're talking about how do you actually achieve racial equality economically. Uh, again, remember I said all these Republicans who got mad at, who got mad at Mehmet Oz when he put out his Juneteenth uh, tweet where he mentioned equality, uh, and then he later uh, deleted that one and put another one out where he, del where he deleted the word uh, equality. Uh, I remember there was a piece that uh, we, 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 we actually reached out to these authors in Hollywood. Uh, Kara, let me know what happened to them because they wrote this piece about how all of these white men in Hollywood were really upset because they said we can't get jobs. Yeah, as if you're not 
getting the jobs right now. Then, of course, you had uh, the, um, uh, the, the author, James Patterson, complaining about how hard it is to be a white man in America, and then they just don't have any opportunities. This goes back to what we talked about at the top of the show when it comes to January 6th, when it comes to the Supreme Court decisions. And, I, I, y'all, I'm telling you, when the book drops in September, I lay it all out there, what we are facing. We are facing folks who do not, do not want to see us get any, any momentum moving forward. And we better be laser, have a laser light focus on demanding, as Dr. King said on April 3rd, 1968, demanding reciprocity when it comes to economics. Because, look, they are going to try to hold this as long as they can, Greg. Are rolling, and there may not be much longer to hold it. We just passed Octavia Butler's 75th birthday anniversary, the science fiction writer. And as Tanavar and Du, Professor Du often says of, of Octavia Butler, she didn't have much hope for the continuing of the human species. This ball is getting ready to evict us. It's getting ready to end humanity. And so we face some real existential threats as a species, global warming, you know, of course. And I'm saying that in this context. You know, perform, the smart thing for, for white people to do in the United States, these white elites, would be to release a little bit of pressure and let a few black elites in. That's what they mean by diversity, equity, and inclusion. They don't want to change the system, and there are black people who don't want the system to change either. And so a little performative, symbolic acts, instead of, instead of material structural change, change names on some buildings, hire two or three more interns, let a Negro be the CEO, that would be enough for enough people to maybe keep them going. But here's where we encounter the problem as a species. Erica, you, 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 you laid it out. When Macron is over there now confronted with an extreme right wing and a left wing over there, he's going to find France is ungovernable. But here in the Western Hemisphere, if you look at what the prime minister of Barbados is talking about, Mia Moore Motley, when you see a sister mm -hmm. like our sister Francia Marquez in Colombia become the first vice president of African descent down there, when you see Lula da Silva probably going to win that election in Brazil and put the Trump of Brazil out in Bolsonaro, and when you see the president of Mexico saying, I ain't putting up with the United States anymore, at the very moment when humanity is beginning to come together and try to talk about systemic and structural change, the United States of America is trying to turn inward and perpetuate their apartheid government. So what's going to end up happening? If you think it's hard, James Patterson, to be a white man in the United States, watch how hard it's going to be to white, be a white man in the world. And what we have to understand as black people, again, this system was always flawed. When we see Benny Thompson stretching this thing out, that fight isn't just about Democrats, Republicans, progressives, conservatives. No, that fight in part is over whether or not you can get past the symbolic acts, past renaming buildings, past knocking down buildings like they want to do with Ovalde with the elementary school, and get to some structural changes that might allow the United States to participate in a world movement that people are trying to organize. Otherwise, this country is already not the superpower it was, and it's headed in the opposite direction. And when China and the rest of these countries get their act together and take leadership, what you fighting over won't even be worth fighting over. The thing, Erica, that we must be focused on again, where do we most have leverage? It's actually not at the ballot box. Where we most have leverage is in that $1 trillion that we spent. And what I keep trying to tell people when I keep arguing how we need to be approaching when it comes to demanding equity, when it comes to advertising, when it comes to money, when we begin to say, as Dr. King laid out in, in uh, Where Do We Go From Here, KSL Community, when you begin to use collective economics, you begin to say, X company, we ain't down with you. Isaac Hayes III, he's been sitting here posting these videos, how TikTok is deliberately, deliberately allowing black content creators to come up with these innovative videos uh, on social media and then to have white creators recreate them and then advertisers put the money towards those white creators. What he keeps saying is stop sitting here clamoring for them to change. He said get off of TikTok. Right. See, here's the thing that I don't understand. I don't understand, understand, Erica. We are the tastemakers. We are the people who make sexy hot. We are the ones who do that. And so at some point, we have got to be able to say, you know what? Yeah. So TikTok, holler, we moving 
everybody we going over the black owned fan base. You can post your yeah. photos, you can post the videos, but see, that has to happen. But as long as we keep allowing people to disrespect us, as long as yeah. we keep allowing the, we, us disrespecting ourselves by spending money with people who don't like us, every time you see, um, what's the rapper, um, uh, Jones, uh, Jones, um, um, Jim Jones? Uh, he goes into one of those stores, Jim Jones, oh, and he yeah, goes Jim into Jones. one of those stores yeah. and he's upset because they're, because they're not yeah. giving him attention. Gucci. But Jim Jones, guess what? Don't give yeah. them, don't give them 29, 30,000. Say I'm going to a black designer and they're going to get my 30,000. Right the now. fact of the matter they is. They right Buckhead yeah. getting that jewelry you talking about we right now. To, they five minutes yeah. where you stand. That's right. <laughs> we. That's it. We have to learn to say we're going to deprive y'all of our money, of our sexiness, of our cool factor, and then let's see what y'all do. Well, there's the blueprint. And you've been talking about it, about our economic buying power. You've talked about over and over again um, with terms. And when I was watching, I watched you all during uh, Juneteenth during that coverage. And you talked about, well, uh, not only to make sure that they're black artists performing it, performing, but black caterers, who are all of the people that are a part of the service industry group? Are they black owned? Are those black owned businesses to make sure that that wealth is not trickling down? Listen, they're always happy as long as we're shucking and jiving. They're always happy as long as we're dancing. They're always happy as long as we're laughing along with them as they imitate what we do. We're the ones that have to cut the noise. Just cut it. It's not funny to me, and it's not been funny for a real, 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 real long time. Um, and I'm almost half of 100 years old, so it's not been funny to me for a real, real long time. For people who don't look like me to come across my screen, across my feed, and to imitate what we do, like they have mm. some type of ownership. What they're doing is they're capitalizing off of it. They're making it theirs. Beauty Insider just had a piece that they released today. They covered this guy that was doing haircuts. And the haircuts he was doing when I was in middle school in the 90s, those black folks were doing those cuts in barbershops. And there were black men, black young boys that were doing the, um, the style cuts, doing Nike swooshes, all kind of designs in the head. And now it is being gentrified. And it is saying that in that piece, um, just to paraphrase it, that look at this style that he's created. You're talking about somebody not black, somebody who wrote a piece, a piece that has been released into the ether known as the internet, and that is taking credit for something that black people have done. So I absolutely agree with you. Just as TikTok announced today that there was a young Senegalese man that has surpassed the number of TikTok followers as um, a girl, a, a young lady who is a non-black young lady. And all of, in the way that it was worded in the New York Post, if I'm not mistaken, is that a laid off worker surpasses and then they named the young lady that um, he surpassed in terms of TikTok followers. But where's the monetization? Is he being paid or is he just famous? So those are the things that we have to take into consideration where we're looking at our wealth. Our worth is already there. And I feel like if we connect our worth that is not then substantiated by the clown stuff that Jim Jones would have, to say that Gucci substantiates our worth. Have those things if you want to have those things. But Gucci didn't make me fly. I came into the atmosphere fly. That's how I came <laughs> into the atmosphere, because I'm first. I'm in the lineage of primary. I'm in the lineage, as you said, sexy, cool, swag. You can do whatever the hell you want to do to your hair, but your shit not going to look like mine or Reese. <laughs> you can say what you want to say, but you're not going to say it the way a luminary like Dr. Greg Carr says it. You can dance how you want to dance, but you're not going to be able to pop lock and drop it like Roe does. So these are the things that we have to take authority of, and we have to make sure that people are not dropping into our lines, making it seem like they're with us, when what in essence they're doing is they're capitalizing, gentrifying, and they're not going to look back for credit. And you want to know why? It's something that Greg said earlier, because it's who they are. This is the premise. The blueprint has already been there. They're continuing yep. to raise beings and people that come into the ether. And people say, well, it's 2022. Well, don't you know in the year of 2022, yeah. there are people from generations back that have appendages 
of mine and yours ancestors and their families mm. as keepsakes, remember mm. who they are. And when you remember who they are, remember you are first. Reese. How am I supposed to follow that? <laughs> uh, you know, like I've said many, many times, you know, we need to validate our own shit. Quit tagging us Period. in what's on MSNBC and CNN and asking us to speak on the stuff that we already spoke on before they spoke on it. Quit tagging us Period. when somebody does a little sister girl like how I do every Thursday, chill, how Erica does, how we all do, how we give them smoke every Thursday and be all up and arms like, ooh, they brought it. We, we bring it every week. Every day <laughs> on Roller Martin Unfiltered. So when people, when we start to validate our own shit, that's when we'll have the power instead of saying, oh, I can't wait to see you on some white shit. Yep. We got our own stuff. Um, I can't wait right. to see you. We, we, you've made it when you're validated by the white folks, when you're on the white face and networks, when you have the white whatever fill in the blank that ain't what validates us when you have the white awards instead of having the abff award or having the naacp and, and all them awards they have their little issues too okay let's be honest but the bottom line is instead of saying oh i can't wait till you get an oscar can't wait till you get a grammy how about i can't wait till you get a soul train music award or something like that uh-huh. we are the fly we are the blueprint that's and when we mean. put but we when we put our own stuff behind our own people, then that's when we'll win. Put it behind our own candidate, so let's bring it back to politics. Because I don't that's I always hear right. it takes a white man to be the white man. Nobody's even talking about how Mandela Bar- Mandela Barnes, who's a lieutenant governor in Wisconsin, mm. is leading Beach. in the polls there for the primary and in the Senate race. Right. Nobody's even talking yeah. about that. You know, Sherry Beasley, she's doing pretty good in the well, polls well I... in North Carolina. So we can if we put our we if we get behind our own folks. And I'm not saying they're perfect. We can get further because trust and believe they are lined up and united behind they folks. That's how they got a 6-3 majority court and they got control of the Supreme Court for yep. decades unless somebody does something about expanding it. That's right. That's it. That's- All right, folks. Hold tight one second. I got go to I gotta go to a break. We come back. We'll hear from the president of Stillman College in our HBCU Connect segment. You're watching Roland Martin Unfiltered right here on the Black Star Network live from Atlanta. Love our new Alexa. It's a Buick. Yeah, Alexa. Buick. Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. It's a Buick. It's an Alexa. Coach, that's a Buick. That's an Alexa. The Buick Enclave with available Alexa built in. We're all impacted by the culture, whether we know it or not. From politics to music and entertainment, it's a huge part of our lives. And we're going to talk about it every day right here on The Culture with me, Faraji Muhammad, only on the Black Star Network. How about sushi? I just had sushi for lunch yesterday. How about tacos? Automatic emergency braking, one of six advanced safety features standard on every 2022 Chevy Equinox. Find new technology, find new roads, Chevrolet. On the next A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie, we're talking all things mental health and how helping others can help you. We all have moments where we have struggles, and on this week's show, our guests demonstrate how helping others can also help you. Why you should never stop giving and serving others on a next A Balanced Life here on Black Star Network. Hi, everybody. This is Jonathan Nelson. Hi, this is Cheryl Lee Ralph, and you are watching Roland Martin Unfiltered. Five years ago, Dr. Cynthia Warwick took over as president of Stillman College. She says she has a lot more in store for that Alabama University. Here's our conversation at the UNCF's Unite 2022 Summit for Black Higher Education. Let's talk um, Stillman. Uh, I did the grad. God, when I did the graduate commencement there? Oh, really? It was years ago. It was years ago. 
I think it was my third or fourth commencement. And so, so you're there in, so there in Alabama. Mm -hmm. uh, you have a number of HBCUs in the state. Mm -hmm. So for you, uh, how are you focused on setting Stillman apart from the other institutions to attract uh, the 21st century student? Well, thank you for that question. You know, Stillman is in Tuscaloosa, and we're three miles from the University of, the, of Alabama. And there has been a relationship for over 50 years with the university. So we're building on that formal relationship and expanding it so students that come to Stillman can start their last year at Stillman in the first year of a master's program at the University of Alabama. They don't have to apply for admission, no GRE, no, no test, and they pay our tuition that first year. So they graduate with our bachelor's degree and then they only have one more year to go with the uh, master's at Bama. How long has that been uh, in place? We just signed the MOU expanding that uh, this year in April. And so how many students do you hope to take advantage of that on an annual basis? I hope that we can get at least 50 mm -hmm. on an annual basis because the programs are primarily STEM programs, although there's some in health and human performance, environmental health, public health, those areas, but primarily in biology and math and population science. You also have been focused on, in some, in some ways, a rebrand, if you will. Yes. The diversity. Uh, you work with uh, Urban Edge Networks. They handle the advertising uh, on my show. Uh, so, so, so talk about that, how that, uh, what they've done thus far, uh, has helped uh, in terms of rebranding the institution, mm -hmm. and, but also bringing in uh, resources that you otherwise were not getting. Right. So that's helped significantly. We are the only HBCU with New Balance. Uh, we're the first HBCU with New Balance, and they're doing all of our athletic uniforms and, and shoes. So that's significant. And then we had a Stillman branded race car in one of the uh, NASCAR races here in Atlanta. And now we just got our new, our gym floor redone and it's, it's, it's beautiful. It's redesigned and it's, it's just lovely. So, so that's gonna make our alumni excited. It's already made our student athletes excited. So all of these programs, our student athletes are excited about being the only HBCU with New Balance. So all of those things help us uh, recruit and retain and graduate students. Uh, when you look at uh, where you are now, what would you say is your greatest need? Mm, greatest need? I would say public-private partnerships. What we do, we have a 105-acre campus, and what we're doing now is to use our real estate to attract partners that can serve not only the campus but the larger community. We're located in the three poorest census tracts in West Tuscaloosa, which is the African-American community. And so what we look to do is really partner with entities that can not only serve our campus but also serve the larger community. Mm -hmm. So economic development, We're, uh, we have a dormitory that was the first female dorm built in 1922, it's in the National Register. We've gotten some grant funds for planning. We're going to convert it into apartments for senior citizens. So housing, affordable housing mm -hmm. for seniors, bringing that population on our campus. So a lot of our students don't have grandparents and getting oral histories, a lot of this history, civil rights history that has not been written, hasn't been heard, we can use that population on our campus as part of our educational initiatives. Uh, we signed an MOU with the YWCA USA. We're partnering with them to put a brand new multi-purpose YWCA on campus to provide childcare, to expand our um, athletic offerings. We'll have a pool and diving, uh, a lot of folks in our community. 
don't know how to swim. And so those kinds of initiatives, so we'll use that for our students as well as the local community. And then we want to build a mixed-use facility for, for workforce housing. There are no apartments. The only kind of housing in West Tuscaloosa is single family and public housing. Mm -hmm. And we really want to see, well, how can we attract the kind of um, housing for even my employees? They, they can't live close to the school because there's no housing. And then retail operations, you know, black-owned businesses, restaurants, mm -hmm. um, you know, there's no subway. We're in a food desert, so there's no subway. There's no, you know, food nearby. And so the students, although we have great food in our cafeteria, mm -hmm. in our dining hall, but who wants to eat the same thing every day? <laughs> who wants to eat in the same place every day? So we need to attract those different kinds of restaurants, and I would love to attract black-owned businesses so that we can train our students in hospitality and, and management and culinary and all of those things. Is, uh, is that one of your um, targeted uh, degree programs? Yes, yes. We've, we've signed an MOU with uh, the Florida International University that has a big hospitality management program and with the University of Alabama. But we really need the the business is there because right. a lot of our students don't have cars right. and, and you know and they're kind of like there's no transportation to get to and from places so if we have everything right there on campus then you know we can create that kind of incubator to help them be entrepreneurs help them learn about mm -hmm. running a business. How many students do you have? We have 800 students. And uh, what has been the largest enrollment you've ever had? 1,900. And, and how, how long, long ago was that? That was back in the 90s. Uh, is, is your goal to get it back to that? We want to be about 1,300 residential and then everything else online. I think online is where we'll see our growth. Stillman's been teaching online since 2007. And so we had applied Probably for... Probably one of the first HBCUs. Yeah, and we, we uh, got approval to teach uh, online degrees in 2019 pre-COVID. So when everything shut down, we didn't. We just pivoted and, right. you know, we were able to do that in a, in a matter of weeks. So I'm thinking other universities were reaching out to y'all trying to figure out how to do it? Yeah, yeah, I got lots of calls, and then we had already joined Acadium about, you know, in terms of um, course sharing, so we have folks that are taking classes at Stillman who are at other universities now. All right, then. Well, sounds great. Uh, I need to get I need to get some of the Stillman gear. I have a, so I have a standard rule in my show. I only wear HBCU gear of places where I've been on the campus. Okay. Uh, so I got to do that. So, uh, so we'll some send of that. you something. We'll send it All to right. you. All right. Well, sounds good. Well, certainly yeah. good luck and I uh, look forward to uh, being back on campus. We welcome you to come anytime. All right. Take care. Thank you. All right, folks, so we uh, will continue our conversations uh, uh, next week uh, with our UNCF presidents. We're not going to be uh, broadcast tomorrow. My team has a day off. Uh, we are, of course, preparing to go to New Orleans for Essence. We're literally bringing the entire team, 19 people will be traveling with us uh, to New Orleans. We're doing specialized uh, content, partnering with Coca-Cola, so we look forward to that. Uh, we do have an Essence throwback. Uh, roll it.
Foreign dreams go. Life is a barren field, frozen with snow. All right, then, folks. So we look forward to seeing y'all in New Orleans for the Essence Music Festival of Culture. All right. Again, uh, glad to have Erica uh, back. Folks have been showing her love on social media, uh, in our YouTube chat, and our Facebook chat as well. Uh, again, back in the saddle. And, of course, uh, the gang is all here, Reese and Greg as well. I want to thank all three of y'all for being with us uh, on today's show. Uh, and, of course, we're going to keep doing what we do. Uh, and, again, uh, we're not going to be here tomorrow. We're going to have other the programming that will be live streaming during this particular time here, but we will be live Monday from New Orleans. We'll be there live all next week uh, to got some fantastic things lined up for you, and so we certainly look forward to it. Let me thank the people from Acura uh, for uh, the uh, media uh, drive that we've had. I'm going to be posting some photos and some video on social media for y'all to check out as well. Uh, don't forget, download the Black Star Network app available on all platforms, Apple phone, Android phone, Apple TV, Android TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV, Xbox one Samsung Smart TV. You can also support us in what we do. Cash App is Dallas Sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Uh, Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is Roland at RolandSMartin.com. Roland at RolandMartinUnfiltered.com. And of course, you can also send us a check in the money order to our P.O. Box. Folks, that is it. I will see y'all uh, on Monday uh, right here. Roland Martin.